when we were in in canada i was just looking at people you know canada people are supposed to be one of the happiest people in the world you know are they really happy i realize the pressure for people to look good is so enormous that you can imagine right today the pressure is that you need to have certain measurements for your body sizes to be even accepted in society and the pressure is so enormous that you will be shocked to see the lifestyle that people lead i'm not saying it's bad it's okay but when it becomes an obsession you don't have happiness there's no freedom in that so i see moms carrying babies in built perambulators meant to jog so these moms are jogging with the baby everybody has got one thing i have to have this absolutely awesome looking figure i'm not joking why am i not joking because i wish i could show you some of the advertisements that were there in the malls the advertisements are so adult that i cannot show it in this it says if you got it you flaunt it and they have pictures of the most scrimply dressed women and the business is you got it you flaunt it and that is happiness you don't have it you are unhappy people are willing to spend lakhs of rupees not small amounts they will spend anything from 25 to 40 lakh indian rupees so that they can come into what people call is an accepted body shape which hopefully makes you happy today i'm going to make you understand that the word of god tries to make you understand and make me understand happiness can never ever be achieved through any of these things in the world it can be transient you can show off whatever you want wear the craziest clothes and walk around but the bottom line is it is transient one day this too will fade away you know the society is so sick that if you do not have what you call is the right measurements it's like you don't have a nose or a eye it sounds difficult in india but that is how the society is driven on top of that there is a concept of absolute freedom they have got toilets with signs over there which are called the uni gender toilets that's for happiness whether you are a male whether you are a female whether you are in between nobody can identify it because the toilets are uni gender they are not very comfortable actually when you are using you know, i don't know in church can we use the word pee but when you are peeing and you get a lady walking in the back not a very pleasant feeling but they say that is important because the other person who is a transgender or they have got his whole list of seven names in between should not feel unhappy at this point this is the worldly standards of happiness it may be based on the fact how much money you have how you look the kind of people you live with but let's see what the word of god tells you okay uh, you have the remote i can use it or we can just move on forward okay so psalms one says a beautiful statement blessed is the one the word blessed can also be translated by saying it happy is the one for example when we look at the beatitudes blessed are the poor in spirit blessed are those who mourn blessed are those who hunger and the greek translation for that blessed is also happy and the same thing when you apply over here it says blessed is the one right happy is the one happy is the one who does not do three things it says over here the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers right okay let's go to the next slide to make it easier to understand okay 
So the three groups of people he puts are the wicked, the sinners and the mockers. Basically, it takes everybody, you know. The sinners, the wicked, the sinners and the mockers. And what does it tell? It says, do not walk with the wicked. Do not stand with the sinners. Do not sit with the mockers. Right? In other words, what is the Bible actually telling you? Keep away from the wicked. Keep away from the sinners. Keep away from the mockers. Now, by keeping away, I'm not saying don't talk to them. Because if you do not talk to them, who will talk to them? It is about something much deeper. It is telling us something about not having fellowship with one another. And we will come to that. Not actually to dwell your resources and your strength from them. Who is the wicked? The morally bad. Who is the sinner? A person who transgresses again the divine law by committing an immoral act. Who is the mocker who defy and renounce the truth and good things? Now, if you look at the broader concept of this, it's very, very important. So, in the time when David was writing this, this could only come through whom? Through? Through people, right? At that point of time, we did not have any other source of taking in information, views, attitudes, unless and until you spoke to people. For example, if people would talk in the time of Paul, you can understand that, you know, there would be these uh, theaters, the amphitheaters, where especially in the Hellenistic world, people would give their opinions, people would give their views. People like Socrates and Aristotle and all those, Gamaliel would, would teach. And this in the time of David was even less. But the bottom line was, it makes you understand when you start dwelling in the midst of people who are morally bad, who continually transgressed against the law of God, who mocked the very existence of God itself, this was not good. In other words, this would not make you happy because we said happy is, it says that happy is the people who did not fellowship with this. Now let's go a little more deeper. I said, but you know, what do we say in today's context? What do you say in today's context? In today's context, when I say do not fellowship with this group of people, this can come just not from, from people, but by what you feed yourself. Okay? What is it that you feed yourself? What are the kind of movies, and I'm not the person who's going to tell you, don't watch any movie, you know. Honestly, factor, sometimes I find movies can be extremely, extremely uh, rewarding if you choose the right movies. Honestly, for the matter, recently on uh, the flight, I watched a movie which is called Tyson's Run. If any of you got an opportunity, please watch that movie. I mean, I would recommend it strongly. It's about a parent, two, uh, 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 I mean, parents actually, father and mother, who had got an autistic child and who was called highly progressive autism. So autism, you know, understand, is a spectrum of disease where they're generally very antisocial. Some of them, their IQs can be exceptionally high and some can be very low. And he talks about the family with this child and how they would finally give up everything to ensure this child would excel in life and do something in life. And it's a beautiful story. It talks about the priorities in life. It talks about where you stand and how exactly you should go through. I don't know if somebody has seen 
a movie called, I think it's The Blind Side. Has anybody seen that movie? Have you seen it? Only you, Sylvina? You know, does this church have movie days? I mean, you all do that? Do you have it? No? I mean, it's a great idea, you know? You know, Wilson, we could sometimes do that. It's called a movie day. And with dinner, Sylvina, the one that you don't have to cook after that. Right? Sylvina, uh, I don't know. I mean, she loves cooking, but she always makes you understand, makes it sound like cooking is a pain. That, you know, cook. So maybe we could do that. See, and the blind side, it's an astoundingly beautiful story of a lady who picks up an Afro-American boy lying in the streets and he becomes the world's highest paid football player one day. Great movie, Blind Side. What I'm just trying to say is that, what I'm trying to say is not, not watching movies, but trying to understand what is it that you feed yourself. Today, when you, on, you take any of the movies, there is so much of filth that you say, it's okay, once. But the biggest problem in this is, you get indoctrinated. After seeing a hundred of them, using several words become look so normal. For example, I'm not using those four letter words starting with F and any of those, just the word Jesus. Jesus Christ. Every villain is using Jesus Christ. Every adulterer is using Jesus Christ, you know. It looks so normal. When you understand the Bible says it's a sacrilege. Living in relationships are so normal in a movie. How many of you think Today you even feel funny when you see living in relationship in the movies. Raise your hands. Anybody get shocked? No, nobody gets shocked. It is so natural. That is the beginning. When you start seeing living in relationships so normal, premarital sexual relationships so normal, today you know how you justified. You don't even think it's abnormal as long as he is having a premarital relationship or a physical relationship with the boy he is in love with or the girl he is in love with and they are going to get married. In the movies it's okay and finally it becomes okay in your own life too. But the biggest challenge that we have is marriages is a problem that people happen because of these kind of issues that come into their life even before marriage. It's exceptionally difficult because once they get married the guilt, the shame and the memories of them destroy marriages completely. But there is no movie that talks about that. So recently, I was just listening to a message uh, of uh, a lady in Mumbai. Her name is Priya Patel. I enjoy listening to her. May not agree everything to what she says, but definitely, definitely, I find it very rewarding. And she told her beautiful stuff. And she said, do you know I realize that there is a setting in Netflix and again, set it for age 16 and less. And suddenly all the movies get cleaned up. What I'm trying to make you understand that when we talk about not fellowshipping with the wicked, with people who trance against divine law, with mockers to divine, understand it is just not physically talking to them, but to understand it every plane in your life, what is the information that you're feeding yourself? The information at one point in time becomes the truth. And you may say, I don't believe it. But the truth is, it is true. The greatest example of indoctrination comes in the picture of Hitler. You know, it's a very good example to use because no, you don't get into trouble in this country. Because he's after all a German guy who even the Germans hate. They were convinced that the Jews were the reason of the economic downfall of Germany. It went on and on and on and on to a point came that every German felt that the survival of Germany was based on the destruction of every living Jew. Nothing could be more wrong. Second World War was the reason US became one of the most prosperous nations in the world because all the brilliant people would finally disappear and go into these parts and there were five million Jews that would be died and killed through the most horrible ways by very same people because they got indoctrinated to believe that a lie was right. You're indoctrinated to believe a certain shape in your body is what makes you happy, what makes you desirable, what makes you beautiful. And you start believing this lie and the lie becomes so indoctrinated in your life that you believe the truth is no longer the truth anymore. 
And that is exactly what the psalmist is saying. What exactly are you feeding yourself every day? You know, there are, you know a classical example of an indoctrination is that marriages make you miserable. Every single joke is about how miserable a marriage makes you, right? Even for the mass, you know, what are the common uh, messages which are supposedly funny that are preached by even pastors? When you get into marriage, you'll have three rings. The engagement ring, the wedding ring, and the suffering. And I got up and said, I don't know how that pastor felt, but I said, is that a prophetic statement or is it your own life? But you don't start a marriage thinking that the engagement ring, the wedding ring, and the suffering, you know. And unfortunately, everything, that's how it is, right? Oh, every joke about marriage is how miserable marriage is. Initially, it's a joke. After some time, it becomes part of your life. It becomes part of your life because you start believing this lie that marriages are meant to keep you unhappy. Marriages are, you know, like they said, I went to the bookstore and asked that person about how does the husband take leadership at home in marriage. And the lady says, sir, the fix and checksons are downstairs. Do you understand? It goes on and on. I can tell you 1,000 stories. What I'm trying to say, Satan can use things in extremely, extremely subtle ways to enter your life. Do you one of the most satanic things that happened through this subtle indoctrination was music. When John Lennon write this song, which song do you know I'm talking about? The song that would transform teenagers to completely, completely believe that atheism was the way to go. Anyone? Boys, girls who listen to music? Or saints who don't listen to music? Which is the song? Imagine. You know that song? Imagine. Hey guys. Nobody knows the song. It was one of the most popular songs that John Lennon would ever write. Imagine there's no heaven, no? Nothing to live or die for. And he goes on to talking about this is the perfect world. Very beautiful, catchy tune. Which you keep saying over and over again, imagine there's a world where there is no God, a world where there is nothing at all, and you start listening and it indoctrinates you. The indoctrination can become so strong that you don't really realize it, but it's subtle. Hotel California is was a song that anyone who loved music loved to listen a million times just to get to play the lead. The Hotel Call in California talks about a journey into hell with no escape when you enter into drugs. Lucy's Got Diamonds in the Sky was a Beatles song that would be taken up, which also talks about the right that you'll have with LSD. If you look at the songs that are all over the world, you understand songs can be a way of very strong indoctrination as you listen to the words. So never ever start singing songs and listening to songs unless you look at the words. Some of them are absolute profanities. You'll be shocked to see, especially rap. Rap music can be so crazy that the word is absolute filth. I'm just trying to open your eyes to a world that is surrounding you, which the psalmist makes you understand 2,000, you know, 3,000 years ago, do not fellowship with sin. Do not fellowship with mockers. Do not fellowship with people or murderers who destroy lives. And I want you to be careful about what you listen, what you talk, the forwards that you read, or whatever you do in your life, the movies that you watch, and even the conversation with the so-called intelligent people that you meet. A couple of years back, I was having dinner with a neurosurgeon in Amsterdam. Brilliant guy. We had gone there for some uh, training on an area, and after that, we were having dinner. And his view about things totally, totally would floor you that half an hour later, you would not believe who's right or who's wrong. He was having a chat with me and said, 
uh, did you go and take a walk in the red light areas of Amsterdam? And I said, no, I really didn't do that. He said, why didn't you go? You know, it's a beautiful place. Actually, by the way, it's uh, not like what you imagine. It's a very safe area within all these windows. And they got these amazingly beautiful girls with hardly any clothes sitting over there. And you just look at them and you feel somebody is good enough, go and have a chat with them and, you know, whatever you want. Now, I told him, no, no, it, that sounds crazy. He said, the problem is in your mind. He said, for example, my son has got two girlfriends. They come and stay with the house and we are perfectly okay with it. And remember, this guy says he's vegan. He doesn't believe in animals being killed. He believes that vegetarianism is the way to go ahead. And then he tells me that it's pretty okay. And I have absolutely no problem about it. And he's telling me that, you know, when you, do you eat dinner every day in your house? Do you go to a restaurant once in a way? So why is it that you differentiate this biological need to that biological need? And this is all in your mind. I think this is ridiculous that you're not even going and visiting. This. I mean, this is our educated people. The top, the cream, the creamiest, creamiest layer you can get in Amsterdam. You sit for him for half an hour. And you start thinking, God, am I so primitive in my thinking? Am I so? This is for half an hour. Imagine if I am actually fellowshipping with him on a daily basis, a month later, three months later, six months later, I will start thinking like him. I want you to get this very clear in your mind that what you talk and what you feed yourself will finally become so internalized that you start thinking like that. Okay? So, uh, I just want to warn you about this and I'll tell you where we go as we come to the end of this, okay? For some reason, it's not moving, so can you move it for me? On this side? Well, I think maybe this, oh, maybe I've got it. Oh, this is the way it is, right? Yeah, okay. So I want you to simply, simply look at this. What does I put a picture about these trees? They're all dying. These trees were once upon time green tree. This is because of the chemical pollution that is taking place in the water. And why is this happening? Because the very source of life for them is water. They feed on water. It's water that brings life to them. It's water that... So, in the end of the day, you understand, this is the problem. The word of God tells us to abide in Jesus Christ. He says, I am the true vine and you are the branches. You can do nothing besides me. The sap that flows into the main vine has to finally flow into the branches. Very simple. This is beautiful, amazing tree. Chop the branch, put it on the ground. How many days will it live? Okay, what's happened? Nobody wants to say. One day, 24 hours, 48 hours. And that is reality. That is reality because in the end of the day, the day you change the source of your nourishment, you're going to die. It depends on what. You feed yourself with poison, you die. You feed yourself with alcohol, slowly your body dies. You feed yourself with a smoke of cigarettes, slowly your body dies. You spiritually, when you feed yourself with something, it ends up in an extremely, extremely bad thing that can happen in your life, okay? So that's why I wrote that it says over here, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked 
leads you to Kenya. That song, one way ticket, one way ticket to the moon, you know, an old song. It's something like that, highway to hell, right? Really, somebody lets up to the right highway to heaven, you know? No. Everything, remember one thing, it's extremely important to understand that what you feed yourself, you know, the 10 minutes of Bible study you do in the morning, the 20 minutes of prayer, the 50 minute, 15 minutes of worship that you do, the one hour of worship you do once a week cannot compete with the way the world indoctrinates you. I still remember once a guy came and he was from some credit card company, I don't know, maybe Diners Club or whatever, and he said, sir, I want you to know, at your position, people should know who you are and that can only happen if you have this card. I don't know what card it was, seriously. And I told him, so where exactly do you want me to keep this card? He thought it was the most dumb question. I said, no, I just want to know, do I stick it on my forehead or keep it in my purse? Because if people have to know that I have got this card and because of that, I have achieved something in life, I mean, it obviously can't be in my purse, you know. I was telling Mother Teresa had a cotton sari with three blue stripes. And the greatest dignitaries of the world came down to pay respects to her when she died. She had an access to president's offices and she could just walk in. She didn't have any credit card from any company on her forehead or anywhere, you know. The thing about indoctrination is that a point of time, every value system, the word of God teaches you completely, completely disappears. And a few hours over here will not change. I keep telling that Sunday schools are just the icing on the cake. The actual cake is what you do at home with the children. Deuteronomy, um, in the book of Deuteronomy, it talks, you know, tie them with cords in your hand, place them on your foreheads, on the posts of the doorpost of your house and on the walls. What he's telling, let the word of God be seen in every action of yours at home. You know what it means by having an icing on the cake? You know, and then anybody can explain? What does it mean by say that you just can't have the icing? You need a cake under that, right? Icing makes it look pretty. Maybe the things a Sunday school does, you can't do at home. You can have a Sunday school play. You can show movies on Sunday school, but they look pretty. They're nice. But you need a cake under that, right? Suppose you go to a shop and you say, I want a birthday cake, you know, and it gives you a big cake. You bring over, you make it. There's no cake inside that, you know. You'll go back and definitely create a scene because that's not what you purchased. And many Christian lives are like that. Only icings. There's nothing under that. And that's why Jesus talks of the parables and says, you sh your foundation should be on solid rock. Okay. Okay, let's go to the next one. Now, Jesus, I mean, the word of God tries to make us understand about this. Psalms 1-3. The person who does not fellowship with the world is like a tree planted by streams of water. The person is like a tree planted by the streams of water which yields its fruit in its season, whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do, they prosper. And everybody loves to prosper. Who doesn't want? No? Our testimonies most of the time is so much about how we prospered. But the word of God is very clear. To prosper, you cannot fellowship with the world. To prosper, you cannot fellowship with the world. Right? Let's just carry on with the next verse. It says, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, I just missed one uh, 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 verse too. But those who delight in in the law of the Lord and who meditate on his law day and night. Um, so the, you understand that. The Bible is trying to make us understand the secret of happiness. The secret of happiness is based on two things. It's a person who meditates on the law and who delights in the law. Anybody can meditate on the law. I can meditate and give you a message. But do you delight in the law? Delighting in the law is an amazing verse which says that in make sure that the word of God truly makes you happy. So what it says, you read the word of God, 
the word of god is telling you this morning that you should not fellowship with sin you should not fellowship with sinners you should not fellowship with scoffers you should not fellowship with people who are anyway out of sync with the word of god and does it bring joy to your heart or make this oh my god this sounds so terrible that's why i don't want to come to church there's a friend of mine who told me the reason i don't come to church church always makes me filled with guilt and shame and i don't enjoy it it takes away happiness right now if you have a problem there's a problem this what about do you delight you delight on the lord and you meditate on the word and then it works and that person is like this like what that person is like a tree who is nourished by living waters all the other people are nourished by dead waters what's dead water a water in which no life exists i will tell you an interesting story when we were in orissa when my dad was there there was a big fight to the bishop and the bishop was asked to resign the bishop had this amazing house that looks like a mini palace and a beautiful pond which was full of fish that he can actually catch and eat so the bishop poisoned the pond so next morning all the dead fish was floating he converted living waters to dead water just like his life obviously if he's dead enough he'll do something what it is trying to say that if you are nourished by living waters the tree also will live this information the knowledge that the word gives you in so many areas is like dead waters it doesn't nourish the soul it doesn't build you up it finally takes you to the highway to death and you will bear fruit every season the word of god also tells us this that the word of in galatian chapter 5 it talks about the fruits that you bear it's a fruit actually not fruits of love joy peace long suffering and he talks of the attributes that we should have as believers if you look also when john the baptist was baptizing and his pharisees is coming he said you brood of wood wipers who asked you to come for baptism bear the fruits of repentance remember the signs of a believer is not in the gifts because the gifts can also be replicated in other forms through other spirit but the fruits can never be replicated so an apple tree cannot bear oranges It doesn't happen have you ever seen that happen no sure about that right right there are some people no go and plant a tree they say wonderful tree you know mango will and it gives the worst mango you know when you cut the tree and throw it it's useless right it's something like that so you understand that it bears its fruit you understand the greatest thing about a christian's life is the fruits that he bear you be great prophets you may do amazing things but if you do not have the fruit that the word of god talks in the book of galatian there is a problem and it says this is a mandatory thing he said if you are nourished by living waters then you will bear fruit what does jesus say who is living water jesus isn't it he tells that to the lady in the samaritan woman who comes to the well he says if you know about the water that i can give you you'll never thirst again and he says i am the source of living waters So in other words if you're nourished by the word of God through Jesus and if you abide in Jesus you will bear fruits every season your leaves are always healthy and you're prosperous I truly believe that poverty is not something that a christian and what i mean by poverty is not living in debt not depending on other people for your livelihood your daily bread can be very different from somebody else's daily bread i always say the word of god teaches in hebrews he gives you grace to run your race he doesn't give you grace to run wilson's race right so our problem is i look at wilson's life and say and well, that's the life i want to lead and i'm saying god it's not good enough wilson's house is bigger than mine he has got more hair on the head than me like no things can be you know for women it could be that also i'm not sure okay what i'm trying to make you understand today is that you will be prosperous you will be a content prosperity means i will be content in whatever god has given me 
But the word of God tells you you're never a debtor. You're a lender, but not a debtor. Every believer is meant to be a lender and not a debtor. When you become a debtor, because the word of God tells you that, look at the birds in the air. Who feeds them? They don't borrow. He tries to make you understand. But the big problem in today's message of prosperity is that righteousness is not what they seek. The word of God tells you that seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. Then all these things will be added. Now when you start thinking of prosperity first, what have you done? You put the cart in front of the horse. It's the reverse direction, right? The the horse is your desire for righteousness. Prosperity follows you. Not the reverse. It can never happen. So ever you hear a message of some, you know, I know there's a lot of preachers, I don't want to use words, who teach prosperity without holiness. When Satan would come and meet Jesus and he'd say, come bow down before me. I'll give you everything. It is prosperity without holiness. So they come, bow, bow down. I'll give you everything you want. Probably Jesus would have become very, very popular, very, very fast. But there would not be a cross at the end of it. There would not be holiness at the end of it. So I'm trying to make you understand today that you will. So if, what is the only factor? Nourished by living waters. Today ask yourself this question. That, are you nourished by living waters, right? Are you nourished by living waters? Just going back again. So to understand this, you have to delight in the law and you have to meditate around 24-7. That's a funny rule. Even when you wake up from your sleep, your thoughts will be focused on the law. I know what you go to sleep thinking. What's the thoughts in your mind? The person who fought with you? The person that you want to take revenge? Thoughts about your girlfriend, your boyfriend, the dirty movie that you watched? You will never prosper. You will die sooner or later. And you will say, no, it's not possible. It is possible as you start hungering and saying, God, this is the life I want to live. You have to ask God this evening, this morning, Lord, I want to delight on the word. When Sylvina came and asked me and said today, shall you have the communion before or after? I said, no, after. Because today I want you to ask God this. God, Give me the ability to delight on the word. If you cannot delight in the word, you will not meditate on the word. If you cannot meditate on the word, you cannot internalize the word. If you cannot internalize the word, you will never live a life that the psalmist talks over here, that you will bear fruits in every season, you will always be healthy, and you will be prosperous even in this world. I'm just going to take a few words of some of, some of the Christian leaders who explains this. I'm sure you can't read this, but let me read it for you. To abide in Christ means to keep up a habit of constant close communion with him. Meditate on it day and night is this. To abide in Christ means to keep a habit of constant close communion with him. To be always leaning on him, resting on him, pouring out our hearts to him, using him as a fountain of life and strength, as a chief companion and a best friend, to have his words abiding in us, to keep his sayings and percepts continuously before our memories and minds, and to make them the guide of our actions and the rule of our daily conduct and behavior. To have his words abiding in us is to keep his sayings and percepts continually before our memories and minds, and to make them the guide of our actions and the rule of our daily behavior. How beautiful can this be? If this has to happen, what is that one fundamental thing that you have to do? What? What should you do? I can't hear, it's a whisper. Before meditating, what do you have to do? Delight. Before delighting, what should you do? Read the word of God. You need to have a disciplined life where you read the word of God. How many of you read the word of God every day in a disciplined way? Don't raise your hands. Don't tell lies. Somebody told me, don't ask me questions and I will tell no lies. Right? 
I don't want to tell a lie. I'm asking you this question that you may answer yourself. Do you have a disciplined time of Bible study? Where you read the word of God. Unless you read the word of God, this can never take place in your life. To have his word abiding in us, to keep his saying and percepts continually before our memories and minds and make them the guide of our actions. Thy words are a lamp unto my feet. How many of you would like to drive a car without headlights in the night? That you can raise your hands. How many of you will drive with headlights? How many of you want headlights in a car at night? Raise your hands. Nobody. Come on, all of you want it, right? The word of God is saying, Thy words are a lamp unto my feet. So you, you want the lamp, right? And the lamp is the word of God. If you don't have a lamp, you don't know what's lying ahead of you. And you will die because there is so much of rubbish on the road. From snakes to scorpions are lying right ahead of you and you will never see it. And this is what we mean by this. Sorry. John Piper, another amazing Bible teacher, he says, our by our abiding in Jesus means our by our trusting him to meet all your needs and be all our treasure. We need to know the word of God to abide in the word of God. Once you abide in the word of God, the truth becomes a reality in our life. And then we know the right from wrong. And then we ask God the strength to follow that path. And then you will bear your fruit in every season. And you will be prosperous in everything that you do. I put this picture to say union with Christ without communion. Christ is joyless Christianity. Many of us are in this boat. Come to church, praise and worship. Sometimes you can talk about Jesus, but actually you are totally disconnected. And that's why Jesus in the book of Revelation would tell the church of Ephesus, I'm no longer your first love. I can go everywhere with my wife. I can call myself husband and wife, but in reality, there is no communion. Her joy is not my joy. My joy is not her joy. My needs are not her needs. Her needs are not my needs. My dreams are not her needs. You know, I want to make you understand sometimes some beautiful things that may be told to people who are not believers or Christians. Sometime back, I was speaking on Women's Day and I was talking about my chairman's wife as an extremely amazing woman that I met. And I'm honestly telling you she's amazing. The chairman of a hospital is extremely dominating. If he wants this door to look like a circle, it has to be a circle. Because that's how he feels. What I was astounded about my Dr. Thawamani's wife was, when my chairman was in US, it was not her dream to come back to India and start a hospital. But once it became his dream, she made it her dream. Then he came back and built a hospital and then he wanted to expand it. It was not her dream. He said, we don't need all this. But finally, his dream would become her dream. And then he started this huge colleges. Every point of time she would fight, she would say, let's not get into it. But once it happened, it would become her dream. I want you to understand a relationship that we have. You could do this. Tell everybody you're a believer. Tell everybody you're a Christian. Pretend that you're married, but actually in real life, you are loving a joyless Christianity because there's no communion. And that can only happen when you delight in the word of God. And delight in the word of God cannot happen unless the Holy Spirit enables to happen, as you desire that. And as you delight, you start meditating. Say, wow, that was so beautiful. Recently, when I was reading the word of God, the Lord spoke to me most amazingly. Many people will come and say, you know, I prayed and God did not answer my prayer. What wrong am I doing? You know, do you know of a time when Jesus did not answer prayer? Jesus did not answer a prayer, let's say. Anybody? Raise your hands. Anybody? Yes, you tell me. What did he pray? He said, here's a question. What should I do to get eternal life? It's not a, it's not only a question. 
This was an absolute prayer. Anybody? The sons of Zebedee, the mother will come. God, I pray that you will keep them on the right and left side. Jesus said, you know, you think you can take the same cup? Happily, she said, yes. And Jesus said, fine, take the cup, but you won't get that position. You never answered that prayer, right? You must understand that God can make you understand. He said, look, you understand. Your prayers has to be right in the sight of God so that it can be answered. And he said, this was a very selfish prayer. God can speak to you in many forms, in many ways. He can teach you many, many things, you know. Just for your need. And he can enable you to grow to great, great signs, okay? Psalm 63 and 1, O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek your soul. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. You know, it's a beautiful example. I don't know how many of you have experienced thirst. Thirst when there is no water and you're really thirsty. You're running or you're caught up in a car with a traffic jam and there's no water, you're desperate. He said, that is the kind of hunger God should give you for a transformation in your life. Okay? But I want to close with a beautiful way of sitting, standing and walking that is there in Ephesians. I want to leave this with you. If you're willing to do this, if you're willing to meditate on the word of God, if you're willing to ask God, let the word become something delightful, as much as the most tastiest dish or the most amazing experience in your life, Lord, I want to do that. So, you know, you something you love, you meditate the whole night, all the time. And it says, if that is it, Ephesians 4, 1, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling which you were called. You will be transformed. You will start walking in a way which is worthy of your calling. And you will be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And you will one day sit together in the heavenly places with Jesus Christ. How beautiful can that be? The psalmist talks about not walking, not sitting, not standing. And Paul is saying, if you start walking in the ways of the Lord, you will be able to stand against the wiles of the Satan and what are you doing with that phone? That light is flashing on my face. I mean, I'm not sure. Boom, boom. Okay. I was just wondering. The flashlight was burning. Okay. Just want to tell you that you will one day sit in heavenly places. But there's no shortcut to sitting in heavenly places. And there is only one way towards it. Living by the word of God. Nourished by the word of God. Nourished by the the way that the Lord taught you, right? This night shall we, this morning shall we ask the Lord to give us the spirit that enables us to delight in the word of God. When we delight in the word of God, we will read it. See, for example, suppose you delight in eating ice cream, we'll find ways to eat it, right? A small thing I used, ice cream, it'll be something much stronger in your life. So ask God to say, Lord, I want to delight on the word of God, right? As you go for a time of communion this morning, this, uh, uh, this morning, let us first ask the Lord in true repentance, say, God, somewhere around the line, Father, the time I spent with the word is not right. I have the word of God before me, but Lord, I do not delight on it. I just read it as a job. I read it because I have to do it. I read it because I've got to preach and say a message. I read it because I feel guilty if I don't, but I'm not delighting it. And from this morning, God, I pray that not only will I delight it, you will enable me to meditate on it day and night. That Lord, that I will be like a tree that is planted on this earth to bear its fruit in every season. To always be beautiful and healthy in the sight of people. Sometime back, when I was there this time in Canada, this beautiful young uh, industrialist actually, he was telling, 
that learn to be a parable for Jesus on this earth. You and I are called to be an epistle for Jesus. Right? So, shall we 